morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this NHS BAT webinar. Um, over the course of the next 45 minutes to an hour, um, Mohammed and I are aiming to provide you with an update on the most recent BAT developments impacting the NHS, um, in particular those that have arisen in the last three months. So my name is Audrey Fearing. I'm a partner within the RSM VAT team and I specialise in advising public sector and not-for-profit clients and I work with a lot of um, NHS organisations. Um, Co-presenting with me today is Mohamed Chikte. Hi. 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 My, my name is Mohamed. Uh, I'm a manager in the, uh, in the VAT team uh, at, uh, at RSM. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to, to kind of let you know how to raise questions during the course of today's webinar. Um, hopefully you'll see a display on the bottom right hand corner of your screen um, that basically says Q&A. Um, if you want to type in your questions there during the course of the, today's webinar, then Mohammed and I will aim to cover these off um, um, hopefully towards the end. Um, if, however, the right hand display is not showing, um, what you need to do is if you double click on the circle icon um, at the bottom of the screen that has the, the three small dots, um, that should then um, pop up a small box, a menu, um, and you'll see at the top there is a blue button that has Q&A underneath it. If you just click on that, then that should bring up the question and answer um, pane for you to, to add in your questions. Hopefully, um, you know, that will work for you and uh, this system is, is fairly intuitive and um, it would be good to see questions coming through from you as, um, as the webinar um, progresses. So, what are we aiming to cover um, for you today? As you'll see, um, most of the agenda actually focuses on COVID-19. Um, so we're looking to cover off um, both VAT easements. We're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at um, recharges specifically related to COVID-19 and um, the associated VAT implications. We're going to cover off some recent case law that we believe will be of interest um, to yourselves during today's webinar. Um, and last but not least, if there's any other business. And so if you have any items that you specifically want us to cover, and obviously they, they're not covered by today's agenda, please do pop them in the Q&A box and we'll endeavour to cover those off as well at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Mohammed, and he's going to cover off the first of the agenda points, which is COVID-19 VAT easements. Hi. Um, yeah, so, so the first point to, or the first area we're going to cover is regarding um, some of the COVID-19 uh, VAT easements that have been introduced um in the last few months um uh, and some of the earliest well one of the earliest was the general vat deferral and this was to support businesses during the covid crisis um the government announced on the 20th of march uh, that vat payments would be deferred for three months um this deferral so this wasn't something that was just nhs this was um to all uk uh, vat registered businesses um and it applies between uh, for payments between the 20th of march to the 30th of June um, and it's something that's automatic so no application or notification of HMRC is required um, but businesses who do pay by direct debit were were required to um, contact their bank um, and then there are a number of uh, sort of easements that were specifically for um, government departments uh, uh, and the NHS um, and one of the first was the COS extension and this was um, uh, detailed in a letter uh, from Mike Barlow on the 7th of April of this year um, and, and due to obviously due to the exceptional circumstances caused by the COVID-19 pandemic um, HMRC provided a, a VAT extension for, for NHS bodies and government departments and uh, this allows for adjustments um, for the financial year 2019-20 uh, to be made on the December 2020 return um, obviously, the, the, the due date for the December 2020 um, return is the 7th of February uh, 2021. So, so it is a, a reasonable extension. Um, 
it should be noted though that this is just a this is just a one off um easement um and it doesn't extend sort of the three month adjustment period for the following year for 2020 21 so that at present will re remain to um uh, sort of the june vat return of 2020 21 which is the seventh, which is due on the 7th of august um one of the other uh easements was regarding estimated returns um if you find uh, that you're unable to submit a COSVAC claim to which uh, HMRC have also provided this, this option of submitting an estimated claim. Um, so if, if this may be sort of using last year's figures, for example, um, uh, on, on your VAT return, uh, to apply for this estimation agreement, you need to make a request in writing to HMRC and send it to the NHS public bodies group. Um, and uh, I, I think there is a there is a deadline specified for that. Um, also notifying an option to tax. So usually an option to tax, you've got 30 days uh, uh, from the date of decision to uh, inform HMRC of an option to tax. Um, but HMRC have extended the time limit to 90 days um, from the date the decision to opt has been made. Um, uh, and this applies for decisions made between the 15th of February and the 31st of May, uh, 2020. So one of the more um, uh, sort of uh, immediate uh, requirements was relating to PPE and the zero rating of PPE. Um, and HMRC uh, initially introduced this. So this was from the 1st of May to the 31st of July, 2020. Um, but at the end of last week, this was on Friday, um, this has been extended uh, until the 31st of October, 2020. Um, and so, so you can zero rate. So, so any uh, uh, goods that you receive, uh, PPE goods that you re that the NHS Trust receives, should be zero rated. Um, and the main objective of, objective of this is to relieve users uh, uh, from the burden of irrecoverable VAT, because obviously under COS you can't recover VAT on goods. Um, and obviously this is essential uh, protection equipment uh, to deal with the uh, COVID emergency. And then the, the zero rate, it, it covers supplies of PPE, so personal protective equipment, including sort of disposable gloves, plastic aprons, uh, fluid resistant coveralls, um, surgical masks, uh, uh, filtering face piece uh, respirators and iron face protection. So there are a number of items that are covered by that zero rating. Um, so NHS bodies, you should, you should ensure that uh, you've not been charged VAT on, on such equipment because uh, obviously it's, uh, you, you shouldn't be paying an extra 20% of VAT on those items. There's also a relief in relation to import VAT on medical equipment. Um, the HMRC uh, waived import taxes on medical equipment. This is, uh, until, this is until the uh, 31st of July. Um, so any medical equipment that's related uh, to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, NHS bodies, they're not required to pay customs duty or import VAT on specific medical goods coming from outside the EU. So this includes ventilators, uh, coronavirus testing kits, uh, protective equipment. Uh, that's the uh, end of that section. I'll, I'll pass on to Audrey now, who will uh, cover uh, recharges. Yeah, so one of the things that we wanted to pick up here was recharges um, from the likes of universities, fire authorities and government departments, because it was noted, particularly right at the beginning of the pandemic, that a lot of public sector organisations pulled together to provide support um, to the NHS, um, particularly as the, the crisis was re reaching its peak. And the concern is, is well, you know, if there is going to be a recharge in payments made from the NHS back to these organisations for the support provided, you know, does that fall within the scope of VAT? And if it does, what VAT rate should be applied? So we thought it would be helpful if we were to look at each of these areas in turn and just to provide you with an update about what you should be thinking about from a VAT perspective. Um, so the first one that we're going to look at is kind of recharges from universities. Um, now, what's interesting is having spoken to actually a lot of our university clients, we kind of identified um, quite a, a reasonable size list 
of um, different types of support that the universities have been providing to the NHS. And we've, we've kind of summarized it here on this slide. So, so the, the, the first one that we've seen um, is secondment of university staff to, to NHS trust. So we know right at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a call for you know, both retired professionals, people that maybe had left the profession, but also professionals within the university sector to, to almost you know, come back and provide support um, in order to cope with the crisis. Um, now, ordinarily, you know, where you have secondment from one organisation to another, we would expect um, that to, to fall within the scope of VAT and for that to be charged. And obviously, you know, where VAT is incurred on supplies of staff, um, unless it's nursing staff, the NHS has no right to, to VAT recovery. Now, one of the things to bear in mind here is that there are um, there is uh, there are a couple of easements that that are available, but they had to be in place at the time the comment commenced. So the first one is obviously if you had um, a dual contract of employment. So we are aware that there are some instances where perhaps a university and an NHS organisation are the employer of the member of staff. Um, in that case, you know, if for example, you know, the, the employee was diverted 100% to the NHS, then any recharge there under a dual employment contract, that would be disregarded for VAT. Um, the other area is where the employee's concern fall under um, what is commonly known as the Memorandum of Understanding. So this tends to be in relation to predominantly clinicians where perhaps they are um, lecturing at a university and employed by the university, but they still do so many hours a week or, or a month working in um, a hospital. And one, to kind of make sure that they're you know, clinical skills and competencies are where they need to be so that they can continue to practice, but also to support them in their university activities. Um, and sometimes it's vice versa, you know, they could be employed by the NHS Trust, but lecturing at the university. Um, where those individuals are covered by a memorandum of understanding, HMRC accept that that's akin to a joint contract of employment and once again is disregarded. So it's well worth considering whether or not if you have got recharges coming through university for supplies of staff, um, that you check to see if it might fall within one of those two um, relief mechanisms, because then that would mean that the university does not need to charge you VAT on those recharges. The other area that we've seen um, a significant contribution is in the use of student accommodation. So, um, a lot of halls of residence were vacated right at the start of the pandemic and indeed students are only just returning to collect their belongings. Um, but in some instances, because NHS staff um, needed temporary accommodation, it might have been because they were living um, with a vulnerable member of their family. Um, uh, also, you know, so they needed to isolate themselves away from that member and needed um, alternative accommodation. Um, sometimes it was to enable them to be closer um, to, to, to the NHS trust facilities themselves. Some NHS staff were accommodated in student accommodation. Now, um, obviously, you know, where that is the case, um, then ordinarily, you know, the supply of, of kind of domestic accommodation is um, exempt from VAT. However, if this is classed as being more akin to, you know, short term hotel type accommodation, then the first 28 days of any recharge would be subject to VAT at the standard rate and only thereafter would it fall within the exemption. So one of the things that NHS trusts to be, need to be aware of is whether or not they could be liable to a VAT charge and some of these recharges coming back for student accommodation. And obviously, you know, that, um, that would represent a, a VAT cost to the NHS Trust concerned. Um, similar to, to, to the student accommodation is the use of non-residential buildings by the NHS. So, you know, we are aware that particularly laboratory facilities were made available to the NHS. Now, if the NHS has exclusivity in relation to those, um, that commercial property, 
then that's going to be an exempt supply unless the university is opted to tax, which might well be the case. If they have opted to tax, then the likelihood is, is that once again, you know, any VAT charge is going to be irrecoverable in the hands of the NHS Trust unless you can demonstrate that it is akin to a managed healthcare facility and therefore recoverable, perhaps under heading 45. Um, but, but, you know, that's going to depend on the specific circumstances, but that's certainly one area that's worth exploring. Um, the next area is the use of university equipment. So we know that a lot of laboratory equipment, testing equipment, et cetera, um, some medical equipment, et cetera, was made available by universities to the NHS. Once again, you know, if there's a recharge in relation to that equipment, that's going to be subject to that at the standard rate. And, um, you know, it's likely that it's going to be an irrecoverable VAT cost in the hands of the NHS. Um, Similarly, the use of laboratory facilities. Um, now here, what, what is interesting is, is obviously under the contracted out provisions, we do have heading 31, which is um, really um, not so much laboratory facilities, but, but um, testing, so testing services. But in relation to that, what ordinarily what we would expect is, is that the third party, in this case, the university, it would be its staff that undertakes the testing. Um, if that is the case, and university staff were, were working in the university laboratory undertaking testing for the NHS, then if that testing is in relation to a named patient, then that's going to be an exempt supply, that recharge. If, however, it isn't in relation to a named patient, it's perhaps a blind test, um, perhaps for quality control purposes or whatever, then the likelihood is that's going to be subject to that the standard rate and would be eligible for recovery under Heading 31. Um, last but not least, there's the potential that other goods were um, provided by universities to NHS organisations. Um, if they are supplied at cost, um, then um, once again, you know, that recharge is going to be subject to that in all likelihood at the standard rate, and that will be an irrecoverable cost in the hands of the trust. If, however, the university provides them free of charge, um, then, you know, the likelihood is, is that, you know, there'll, there'll be no VAT implications associated with that. So, as you can see, you know, if you've got any recharges coming across from universities, it's really important that, that you kind of understand what the associated VAT liability is. And even if the university has not current charged a VAT, that doesn't mean to say that they won't do a catch-up exercise, because the danger is if they don't get the VAT treatment correct, then HMRC will come along at a later date and potentially um, uh, raise an assessment. One of the, the things that, that is also important to be aware of is that um, the British University Finance Directors Group has been engaging with HMRC in relation to the subject of recharges because they've recognised that, um, you know, these are particularly unusual circumstances. And what they have done is they've, they've written to HMRC and they've requested a number of easements in relation to some of the recharges that I've listed up there. Um, and, and the, the, the requests that they've made are things like, for example, that any recharges in relation to seconded staff, um, both um, clinicians, but also perhaps medical students, postgrad students, et cetera, that they should be recoverable by the NHS under the contract without services provisions. Um, now, they've made the request, but unfortunately, HMRC have yet to come back to say either yes or no. Um, but, but, you know, the question has been asked. Similarly, in relation to recharges relating to accommodation, they've asked that if VAT is chargeable in relation to accommodation recharges, both um, student accommodation, but also the use of um, university facilities, that these be recoverable under cost heading 53. Um, so, so, you know, which I, I think would be really useful if HMRC did agree to that. Um, and they've also asked that anything to do with laboratory facilities, whether it's for named patients or, or blind testing, et cetera, that they be allowed to charge VAT, but that be recoverable under heading 31. So I think um, 
certainly in relation to university recharges, um, don't be surprised if the universities do charge you VAT. Um, apply the normal COS rules as they currently stand today, but watch this space to see if HMRC announce any retrospective easements in relation to this request from um, the British University Finance Directors Group. And obviously, if we hear anything um, before our next webinar, um, we'll of course um, issue out an alert just so that our NHS clients are aware of, of any possible easements in relation to the contracted out services provision. The next area of potential recharges is, um, is from fire authorities. And, um, you know, what we saw was um, a lot of fire authorities actually um, working really closely with some of the NHS ambulance trusts um, to help drive ambulances. They were also actively involved in delivering essential medical equipment providing support to paramedics and clinicians, um, providing care, etc. Um, and, you know, that, the, the amount of support that the fire authorities provided was not insignificant and therefore there are likely to be, and have been actually, a number of quite large um, recharges going across. Um, RSM actually worked for quite a few of the fire authorities and we were engaged on this issue um, from an early stage. And one of the things that we did was that we reached out to HMRC um, and put forward a, a, a technical argument to basically say that, you know, the support being provided was very much akin to the current um, emergency co-responder arrangements. You know, whereby, for example, if there's a 999 call, um, for example, it might be a road traffic accident, um, then, you know, the recharge from the fire authority across to the, you know, the, to the NHS, for example, for extracting drivers from the vehicles, supporting the injured on scene, etc., that that is disregarded from a VAT perspective perspective and um, what was um, really positive was that HMRC actually agreed with our analysis and, and felt that coronavirus could be regarded as fire authorities responding to an emergency and in that case they accepted that the fire authorities did not have to add VAT to their recharge. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a really positive precedent that they've set. Um, but obviously we have the co-responder uh, rules to rely on in that particular instance. But one of the things I would say is that if any of your organisations do receive a recharge from a fire authority, do point them um, at this particular relief and basically say HMRC have confirmed that this is akin to a co-responder um, recharge and therefore does not fall within the scope of VAT. I'm going to go back. The other areas where we see recharges are um, from the likes of the MOD local authorities. Now, one of the things that we've seen is, is that the MOD have obviously been responsible and have played a, a not insignificant part in terms of the um, logistics relating to the creation of the Nightingale hospitals. Um, and I know that you know the MOD played quite a big part in that. In addition, they've also played a big part in the setting up of the pop-up testing stations, both from a logistical perspective, but also in terms of manning some of those um, uh, temporary testing stations. Um, and um, obviously, the, the cost that they've incurred in relation to providing that support is, is not insignificant. One of the things that we're not aware of, though, is whether or not HMRC will treat any recharges from the MOD similar to the way that they're treating fire authorities. Um, because, you know, in many instances, you know, this is an emergency. Um, the MOD are providing, a, you know, a range of support that perhaps, you know, could not have been provided by an external third party provider. Um, and therefore, you know, it probably makes sense that these those recharges should also be outside the scope of VAT. But HMRC have not opined on that yet. So what I would say is that if you do have any recharges from the MOD, 
which have been subject to VAT, it's well worth exploring that as a possibility with HMRC as to whether or not they too can be disregarded. Where you've got recharges that are coming in from any other organisations, um, you know, it could be local authorities, it could be, you know, where, for example, dentists have been supplying PPE back into the NHS, then, um, you know, the normal VAT rules will apply. So in the case of PPE, they should qualify to be taxed at the zero rate, but if it's recharges in relation to anything else, so, uh, you know, non-qualifying equipment, staff, use of facilities, etc., then the normal VAT rules will apply um, and you should expect in most instances for VAT to be applied. And obviously, you know, unfortunately that's going to be the recoverable cost in the hands of your organisation. And that's really it um, in relation to recharging. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's probably recharges coming in from other organisations as well that we haven't touched upon. So if you've got some particular examples that you would like to explore in a bit more detail, please pop a question into the Q&A box and um, we'll endeavour to cover that off at the end of the session. So the next area that we wanted to cover off was just um, some recent case law um, that we thought would be of interest um, to NHS organisations. And um, we've selected three cases that we're going to cover off um, in this particular session. Uh, so the first one that we're going to cover is Main Pay Limited, um, and this relates to, to the supply of temporary staff and um, where it was held that the supplies were subject to VAT at the standard rates. Um, what's interesting about Main Pay is that they were effectively an umbrella company, and um, what they did was that they supplied medical staff to NHS bodies. Now, main pay treated um, the, the, the clinical staff as its employees. So it actually employed the clinicians um, and it paid PAYE and national insurance contributions in relation to those employees. And the contractual documentation between main pay and the NHS trust concern stated that what main pay was providing was clinical and medical services. Um, so primarily um, the diagnosis um, and development of treatment regimes um, for patients um, who were attending um, NHS facilities. Um, the first T tribunal um, looked at the contractual um, documentation very closely, but it also um, uh, took cognizance of actually, you know, what was delivered on the ground and how the main pay um, clinicians engaged uh, with, with the NHS customer, etc. And, and basically what the first tribunal um, determined was that whilst the consultants were employees of Main Pay Limited, which was quite clear, they felt that what main pay was providing was not medical services, but actually the use of those employees and making those employees available to the NHS Trust. Um, and basically it held that even though the clinicians were quite senior, you know, they were all qualified, they were all able to act autonomously in terms of, you know, um, meeting with patients, diagnosing what the uh, what the illness or the condition was, um, recommending a, a, you know, a course of action, they still felt that those clinicians, when they were on trust site, fell under the direction and control of the NHS customer. And, and that was on the basis that, you know, that, that they were basically given a list of patients that they had to see. Um, they had to follow, um, you know, all of the health and safety requirements whilst on trust site. Um, they had to complete documentation in the way that was determined by the by the trust organisation itself, um, and follow, you know, um, designated processes and procedures um, as per the trust. Um, they didn't really have any control over their working hours in the sense that, you know, if they were meant to be there nine to five, they couldn't decide, oh, well, I'll just be there, 
you know, three to four, um, you know, they had to be there for the designated time and see the patients that were allocated to them. They had no control over those patient lists. Um, and therefore, um, you know, the tribunal held that actually this was a supply of staff subject to VAT at the standard rate rather than a supply of exempt medical care. And obviously, as you all know, you know, if you have a supply of staff, um, that's going to be, you know, the VAT on that is going to be an irrecoverable cost. To, to the NHS organisation, unless the staff concerned are nursing staff. Um, now, obviously, you know, not only does this co create an irrecoverable cost for those um, NHS organisations that have contracted with main pay, but it also calls into doubt um, potentially, um, you know, arrangements with other providers who have also implemented similar arrangements. Um, so these are obviously where they're saying we're providing you with an exempt clinical service. Um, so if you are an NHS organisation and you have implemented a temporary staff um, delivery model with a third party provider that has historically, you know, um, enabled you to, to kind of procure temporary staff free of VAT, it's definitely worth revisiting your contractual arrangements to see whether or not you are on all fours with main pay. Um, because the likelihood is, is that, you know, definitely going forward, you know, your, your, your supplier will look to charge VAT in relation to those. But also, they may also be forced to issue retrospective VAT invoices um, going back at least four years. Um, now, one of the things that that's that we, we're not aware of is whether or not main pay are going to appeal this decision. Uh, and obviously, if they do, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, if your provider, however, has what's called the direct engagement model, which is where they introduce the employer to the NHS Trust and the NHS Trust becomes their employer, even if just for a day, um, but you are responsible for PAY in NIC, then um, the likelihood is, is that you know that that your that that arrangement is still okay um, and is not subject to challenge. Um, but it's definitely worth looking at um, you know your current arrangements to see if you are caught by main pay. And as I say, we'll keep you informed if main pay decide to to appeal this particular decision. I'm now going to hand you over to Mohammed, who's going to cover off the two other cases. Yeah, so just a couple of other cases that I'm going to cover. Um, the first is uh, NHS Lovian, um, and it, it's regarding a Fleming claim. Uh, it's a health board in Scotland uh, which uh, submitted a, a Fleming claim in 2009, and this was to recover input tax and services uh, supplied by its laboratories from 1974 to 1997. And these were services that were supplied to non-NHS customers, uh, and they argue that these were business supplies and therefore taxable. Um, uh, but the, the, uh, in, in 2017, the first year tribunal accepted that the lab's activities were taxable business activities, but it dismissed the appeal on um, methodology grounds. They found that the uh, extrapolation of the, of the claim from the lab's 2006-07 figures and the lack of any partial exemption method were unacceptable. Um, but in 2018, 2018, the upper tribunal dismissed the appeal and found in favour of HMRC. The Health Board then appealed again to the Court of Session, and that has now uh, overturned the Tribunal's decisions and found in favour of the Health Board, uh, and said that the FTT, the First Tier Tribunal, uh, did not properly address the issues of the methodolo methodology in the quantum. Um, uh, so, so if you have a Fleming claim in place uh, with HMRC and it's still not been paid for the reasons stated, then it may be worthwhile to contact uh, HMRC uh, regarding this. There was, a, there was another case a few years ago, um, North Lynx and Ghoul, where the tribunal stated that um, the burden to provide certain information was on HMRC. Um, and some of those claims, I think Audrey will be able to uh, uh, mention this as well later, uh, some of those claims were, uh, were paid, but I think a few organizations were still waiting for uh, payment of some of the Fleming claims. Um, as you know, some of the Fleming claims have been going on for a number of years, and uh, uh, the, uh, 
one of the main sort of sticking points has been the, the provision of uh, certain information. HMRC have asked for um, uh, information going back a number of years, um, and this has been particularly difficult where uh, NHS trusts have, have changed names, obviously names and uh, 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 the types of organisations have changed significantly in the last uh, uh, 40, 45 years or so. Uh, the next uh, case is regarding uh, uh, window to the womb, um, and this is just this is regarding uh, uh, scans. Um, and they operated window to the womb operates a sort of a franchise model um, for CQC registered businesses, and they supply ultrasound scans to uh, to pregnant women. Um, they took the view that the service provided in its clinics uh, uh, was medical care, and uh, therefore exempt. Um, so, and it was the sonographers were registered medical professionals, and this was sort of one of the uh, uh, important points that they that they would stress as stating why they believe that this was um, uh, uh, medical care and exempt medical care. Uh, HMRC accepted that the sonographers were registered medical professionals, but it took the view that the overall service provided by the clinic was not actually medical care. Um, However, the, the tribunal found in favour of window to the womb, um, and it found that it made exempt supplies of medical care. The principal purpose uh, of, a, of a typical customer uh, procuring a, 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 an early pregnancy scan is to diagnose a medical condition. Um, so if there's any medical issues, obviously, then that would be the reason that, that the uh, mother would, would, would seek a, a, a scan. Um, and so, so yeah, so such such scans are exempt. I think one of the reasons uh, 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 for this is that HMRC that continue to test the boundaries of the of the health exemption. Um, have a medical NHS trust and NHS body should continue to treat scans as med medical care. Um, I'll just pass back on to to Audrey now to just run through a quick summary uh, of what we've spoken about today. Thanks for that, Mo. Um, so I think certainly from today's session, I think the key points to note are obviously, you know, the VAT deferral for monthly and quarterly periods ends on the 30th of June 2020. So if your NHS organisation has it availed itself of this relief and has been deferring the payment of any VAT that might be due, um, although in most circumstances, I would expect you to be in a repayment position, then that ends on the 30th of June. I think what would be interesting is if you've got any um, subsidiaries um, where you might have chosen to defer the VAT payments, please remember that that deferral now ends. Um, and basically, you know, from the May return onwards, you need to be paying the tax due by the due date. Um, obviously, you know, if you've deferred the payment of any VAT in relation to those periods, that has to be paid by the 31st of March 2021. Um, so um, thinking about, you know, how you might go about doing that. If that's going to be problematic, then HMRC do have um, the ability to agree time to pay arrangements. Um, and I have to say, I've been incredibly impressed by how understanding and accommodating HMRC have been during this current crisis. Incredibly supportive. Um, but what I would say is, is that when the full realisation of the cost of the pandemic is known by Treasury, the likelihood is, is that their ability to, you know, to be accommodating may reduce. So if you have a subsidiary where you have deferred the VAT payments and you are concerned about whether or not you can repay any VAT that is due by the 31st of March 2021, I would wholeheartedly recommend that you start to engage with HMRC now about an extended time to pay agreement um, because they're more likely to agree now, whereas if we leave it till after Christmas, my gut feeling is, is that they, they won't have the ability to be as accommodating. Um, obviously, you know, as, as, as Mo alluded to, the cost adjustment deadline has been extended to the 7th of February 2021. 
So for, for those organizations where you are finding it, it difficult um, to, to meet the normal deadline, then, then this is available, but this is a one-off. Um, so please don't assume that HMRC will extend it again next year. Um, and um, obviously, you know, the key thing is, is to make sure that you are able to capture any additional recoverable VAT for 2021 um, or for 1920, actually, and include it in that February VAT return. Um, we covered off in the session COVID-19 recharges. I think the key thing there is to make sure that VAT has been charged correctly by um, you know, the other government department, local authority, et cetera, concerned. Um, <clears throat> and also, certainly what I'm recommending to our clients is that where you are getting recharges from um, other public sector organisations, capture that information because um, if Buff Dog, um, so the British University Finance Directors Group, if their request is acceded to, you know, or if we can identify significant large recharges, we may be able to reach an accommodation with HMRC. And it's by having information in relation to the values of such recharges to hand that will help those conversations with HMRC and HM Treasury progress. So I would definitely look to see and try if you can capture that information separately. And the likelihood is, is you're already capturing additional COVID-19 spend anyway for reporting purposes um, up to um, NHS England. Um, and then last but not least, you know, please review your temporary staff models that you perhaps got in place to ensure that you're not caught by main pay. If you are caught, then it's definitely worth talking to your supplier to ask what their proposed course of action is. Um, and for you to determine, you know, what the likely impact is on your organisation. Um, just to, to confirm, you know, a link to this recording and these slides will be will be emailed to you, um, and we will be running another webinar in September. So please look out for the invitation. If you've got any questions that you would like us to to, to respond to, we've we've actually got 15 minutes left of today's session. Um, if you would like to, to ask any questions now, or if you've got any other points that you were hoping we'd cover and we haven't covered, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box now, and um, Mohammed and I will do our best um, to, to answer those. So we, we do have one question that is, um, one of the questions we have is about the temporary rating of PPE, and it's asking if it's been extended. Uh, uh, well, the temporary rating of PPE has been extended, but is there any extension to the import relief? Uh, uh, expected. And uh, there isn't anything at the moment, HMRC haven't stated whether or not this is something that will be extended. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier was um, that the that the, um, uh, uh, the import, um, the release, release on import and customs duty uh, are in place since, the, um, since January the, the 30th. If you do have um, or if you, if you did import any um, uh, any items since January the 30th, you can, and you haven't uh, uh, and you were charged um, import VAT or customs duty on those items, you can go back and reclaim and submit a reclaim to HMRC for those items. Um, if you're unsure about which items um, are covered by the import relief, so the customs duty relief and the import VAT relief, on HMRC's website. They do have a commodity codes list that um, details the items um, uh, uh, which are subject to the relief. Um, we can send a link to that, I think, with the slides later on, if that would be useful. Audrey, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Or? Yeah, the, the, I just, I, it looks like we've got another question that's just come through on outstanding Fleming claims. Um, somebody's asked, it's basically said their trust has still got an outstanding claim and will HMRC now pay it? Um, I have to say that I, I still find it quite shocking that, that all of the Fleming claims haven't been paid now. I think what the NHS loathing case does give you is that opportunity to basically say, you know, that, the, that so long as your approach and your methodology is fair and reasonable, that HMRC can no longer stall and delay. Um, so I think it's definitely worth 
reaching out to HMRC to find out from them what their proposed course of action is in relation to your particular claim. Um, but you know, one of the things that 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 will be interesting is is that now that the tribunal has basically said, well, the the court session in Scotland has basically said that the VAT tribunal erred in law in that it should have opined on the methodology. The NHS Lothian case is now going to go back to the tribunal. <laughs> um, and the tribunal will have to look at the methodology that was proposed by the board and determine whether or not it thinks that it's fair and reasonable. So one of the things I would say is that once that case is heard, um, then that will probably give you greater clarity. So the likelihood is, is that you know, you've still got some time left to wait, but it's definitely worth engaging with HMRC to, to find out you know, what is their proposed course of action. But the likelihood is, is that until the tribunal kind of makes a determination in relation to the methodology that the board um, utilised, um, and you know, often when when they are advising on methodologies and approaches, you know, that we don't get to an exact answer. But what they might do is push back something to both parties, both HMRC and the appellant, to basically say you need to look at this, or we think you should take this approach and therefore you need to rework the calculations to determine the quantum of the refund. So, you know, we, we're probably waiting another 12 months on that, um, but hopefully, you know, we're, we're close to the end now. Um, but it is ridiculous, bearing in mind that this has now been rumbling on since 2009. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a long old stretch, I think, but, but, you know, I think there is definitely now light at the end of the tunnel. Mo, there's a, there's a question here as well that's been posed, which is um, one of the, the, the trusts on the call already has a laboratory subsidiary in place, and they want to know if it will be affected by um, Buff Dog's request of HMRC. Yeah, so um, obviously the, the Buff Dog uh, uh, query was in relation to universities, but generally, um, it, it depends upon the arrangement that you have. So a lot of um, laboratory services, um, if they're for named patients, etc., they those such services would be exempt. Um, but it depends upon the arrangement. Some some uh, uh, organisations will have arrangements where they have split between their laboratory uh, uh, services and sort of their more maintenance type services, um, sort of the facilities management of the laboratories. Um, and that would already be recoverable under cost heading 45. Um, so it does depend upon the arrangement that you have in place. Uh, Audrey, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, I don't think so. Right. Well, if there are no more questions. A, sorry, there is another question that's come through about GP surgeries. All right. Um, uh, and it says, uh, as a GP surgery, being able to recharge additional costs for PPE staff and expenses over and above the normal operating costs. Uh, for the surgery to our local CCG, um, how should the money paid to us be classed for for VAT? Should it be exempt output? So, can you repeat that again? No. So it says, uh, as a GP surgery, being able to recharge additional costs for PPE staff and expenses over and above uh, normal operating costs for the surgery to our local CCG. How should the money paid to us be classed for VAT? Uh, should it be exempt output? It should be. Oh, good question. Um, I think. Well, my gut reaction is is that obviously, you know, if if there is a recharge going from the GP surgery into the CCG in relation to PPE, um, then and perhaps maybe that's a transfer of existing stock, et cetera, then that would qualify to be taxed at the at the at the zero rate. I think if there are recharges in relation to, for example, additional costs to do with medical care, um, then that's going to fall within the normal VAT exemption. You know, for example, you know, if the, the surgery has had to take on more locums in order to cover, you know, um, to cover 
kind of you know patient interactions etc then i would expect that to just fall within the normal vat exemption if the the gp surgeries incurred additional costs though for example from a technology perspective so that it can do um you know remote consultations you know so kind of conference call type and video conference call type um, consultations to me, that's kind of just part and parcel of the exempt supply. It's just cost component. So, um, you know, if it's incurred those costs and it's recharging, I would expect that to just be wrapped up and it and it not to be a separate supply to the CCG, um, and it would be wrapped up within the exempt medical care provision that they're providing. Mo, have you got anything to add on that one? No, I was just going to say something similar it just depends upon the um, uh, yeah I mean with PPE um, if it's just PPE alone um, then you would yeah you would say that that would be zero rated um, obviously with staff and expenses it, it then depends um, what your arrangements are yeah uh, yeah. yeah no that's uh, I think that's Is that it. all of the questions yeah yeah Those are all the okay. questions for the time being right Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for, for participating in today's webinar. I hope that you found it useful um, and that the topics we covered were of interest. Um, as I said, um, we're running another webinar session in September, so please look out for the invitation um, to attend that. Um, and of course, if anything happens in relation to VAT that impacts on the NHS, in the meantime, you know, we will issue an alert to, to all of our clients. Um, but once again, thank you for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your day.